In this recording, we're going to discuss blood pressure maintenance. We have two ways of maintaining your blood pressure. We have short-term mechanisms and we have long-term mechanisms. Short-term mechanisms um, are primarily accomplished by your nervous system and some hormones of the endocrine system as well. The way in which short-term uh, control of your blood pressure tends to work is we are trying to either affect peripheral resistance and or your cardiac output. So, nervous system, your good old parasympathetic nervous system, by way of your vagus nerve, releases acetylcholine onto some of your cardiac pacemaker cells, okay? particularly your good old SA node and your uh, AV node, as well as your atrial cardiac muscle cells, since these are the cells that are going to start your heartbeat. When we activate your parasympathetic system and release acetylcholine onto your pacemaker cells, we are going to end up decreasing your blood pressure because we are going to slow your heart rate. Slowing your heart rate will decrease your cardiac output. Decreasing your cardiac output will decrease your blood pressure. Okay. There is no direct um, innervation of your parasympathetic nervous system to the blood vessels themselves. So when we talk about your parasympathetic nerve system affecting um, anything with your cardiovascular system, we're specifically talking about just the heart itself. Now your sympathetic nervous system. Okay? Now we're going to use epinephrine and norepinephrine release onto the cardiac muscle cells themselves as well as the smooth muscle cells of the blood vessels. So notice your sympathetic nervous system okay, does directly talk with the blood vessels, okay, unlike your parasympathetic system that we just mentioned. Okay. So epinephrine and norepinephrine onto the heart and the vessels. Um, both of these will lead to increased blood pressure because in your heart we are going to increase both the heart rate and the contractility, so we're going to start beating faster and more forcefully. These will both increase cardiac output, which increases your blood pressure. Releasing epinephrine and norepinephrine onto the smooth muscle cells of the blood vessels will cause vasoconstriction. Okay. Vasoconstriction will decrease the diameter of the vessels, which will increase peripheral resistance. Increasing peripheral resistance will increase your blood pressure. Um, and just fun fact, interesting side note, your vasomotor center okay, um, can be stimulated by emotions. So um, think about the last time you like ugly cried and got really upset and emotional. Your heart rate went up, okay, your cardiac output increased, and it actually increased your blood pressure. Okay. Now, we have briefly mentioned uh, the baroreceptors that we find um, in your heart and in your carotid arteries. Keep in mind what are these guys doing. Baroreceptor, remember this is pressure. Baro means pressure. These are involved in a negative feedback loop that activate in response to an increase in blood pressure. Okay. So if your blood pressure gets too high, your baroreceptors notice. They chat with the medulla in your brain stem, that vasomotor center. We're like, hey, blood pressure's too high, calm it down. Okay. So we activate your good old parasympathetic nervous system through your vagus nerve. Okay. And we just mentioned your vagus nerve will release acetylcholine onto your SA node, your AV node, your atrial cells, and this will all decrease your heart rate. Okay. Decreasing your heart rate will decrease your blood pressure. Okay. Um, now, the opposite can also happen. Okay. Um, if your blood pressure goes down, okay, your baroreceptors will also notice that they are not being activated as much. There's less stretch going on in these major vessels. Okay. We will also send a signal to your giant brain your medulla, 
Okay, but now we will stimulate in the sympathetic nervous system instead. Okay, we'll release the epinephrine and norepinephrine. We will stimulate both the heart as well as the blood vessels, which just aren't shown in this picture. But all that will ultimately increase your blood pressure. Okay, so your baroreceptors can help activate um, this feedback loop. If we have an increased blood pressure, we can try to lower it. Or if we have a decreased blood pressure, we can try to raise it back up to homeostasis. Okay, and we've got our pictures here. Okay. Just to reiterate, if your blood pressure increases above normal range, okay, our baroreceptors will notice. We'll chat with our medulla oblongata. Okay. We will do parasympathetic stimulation, release acetylcholine directly onto the heart. Notice we have not messed with the blood vessels. Remember, there is no direct innervation from the parasympathetic system to the blood vessels. However, if our blood pressure gets too low, our baroreceptors notice. We send a different message to the medulla saying, hey, now our blood pressure is too low. We now stimulate with our sympathetic nervous system to the heart and the vessels this time. We will increase heart rate, which increases cardiac output and blood pressure. And we will vasoconstrict, which also increases your blood pressure. Okay. Carotid sinus massage. Mm. Okay, so you can quote unquote massage your carotid sinuses, your large carotid arteries. Okay, um, if you do both of them, okay, simultaneously, this can initiate that baroreceptor reflex in an artificial setting, okay, in an emergency situation. We can do this to reduce dangerously high blood pressure. Okay, this is like, like you're in the ER or something. You're not just like doing this for fun, y'all. Um, so if you are in lab, okay, or in a clinic or something, and you are just trying to, you know, get more comfortable with certain things, um, never try to feel for your pressures in both of your arteries at the same time because you could accidentally do this. You could actually accidentally um, trigger this up here and um well i mean you could make somebody pass out lose consciousness so don't do that okay don't do that one side at a time in clinics and in labs and things like that um, if you are in an emergency situation and you are now a officially trained professional then we can try this carotid massage um, with a lot of supervision okay um, still under short-term maintenance. Let's get back to our sympathetic nervous system. Um, Valsalva maneuver, which is kind of hard to say. This can be used to test whether your baroreceptor reflex is still working or not. Um, so here's kind of how it works. You can bear down and try to expire, aka okay, breathe out, against a closed glottis. Um, so, like, how would you do this? When would you do this? Why would you do this? Think about um, how you feel when you cough, when you sneeze. Um, if you are, um, quote unquote, bearing down to defecate. Mm -hmm. Or if you are uh, lifting something really heavy. Okay. What does all of this do? This raises the pressure in your thoracic cavity. This causes a reduction in venous return, okay? Um, and if we're not putting as much blood back into the heart, this causes your blood pressure to drop, which should trigger your baroreceptor reflex um, to increase your heart rate, thereby increasing your blood pressure, okay? Um, again, this is just a, a, a way to test your baroreceptor reflex. It's kind of interesting. All right, we've mentioned baroreceptors a couple times. Let's not forget about chemoreceptors. Okay. You have central chemoreceptors. Okay, here's your central chemoreceptors in your medulla oblongata. Okay, or your medulla, whatever you prefer. These respond to a decrease in pH of the interstitial fluid in your brain, your cerebral spinal fluid. Okay, good old cerebral spinal fluid. So pH, okay, 
What are we talking about? We're talking about carbon dioxide getting turned into bicarbonate. Okay, and our intermediate is carbonic acid. So these are acids, and this is more of a base. So these three things directly increase or decrease the pH of your cerebral spinal fluid. Okay. We have another feedback loop here that can indirectly increase activity of your sympathetic nervous system, which would result in vasoconstriction and a rise in blood pressure, okay, via rising uh, heart rate. All right, so if we have too much acid going on, we can increase heart rate which would ultimately in also increase respiration rates to get rid of some of this acid. If we don't have enough, okay, we can slow everything down to adjust your pH back to normal as well. We'll talk a lot more about uh, carbon dioxide, carbonic acid, bicarbonate when we talk about both the respiratory systems and the urinary system. Okay, so we'll come back to this idea. All right, we also have a few chemicals that will control your blood pressure. Histamine, um, we have mentioned histamine a couple of times by this point. This is a vasodilator secreted during the inflammatory response. We have now learned that vasodilation will decrease your blood pressure. Nitrous oxide is also a vasodilator. This is commonly used during dental procedures. Okay, it's also called laughing gas. This will also, since we're vasodilating, this will decrease your blood pressure. Nicotine, however, is um, a strong vasoconstrictor. Okay, this will increase your blood pressure. Okay. All right, we did mention there are a few hormones that will help with short-term maintenance of blood pressure. Okay. Um, we've mentioned epinephrine and norepinephrine previously. Epinephrine will increase your heart rate and the contractility. Okay. Norepinephrine will cause vasoconstriction. And then thyroid hormone will also increase your heart rate. So all of these will directly affect your cardiac output. Okay, All of these will increase cardiac output, which increases blood pressure. Epinephrine and norepinephrine um, also cause um, vasoconstriction. And not only does that affect cardiac output, but it also increases peripheral resistance, which increases your blood pressure. Angiotensin II is also a vasoconstrictor. Keep in mind, angiotensin II plays a role in the RAS system. Okay. The next step would be um, secretion of aldosterone. We'll come back to that in a little bit. But vasoconstriction, again, increases... Um, peripheral resistance, which increases your blood pressure. And then we have atrial natriuretic peptide. We've mentioned him a few times. Okay. Um, this will cause a mild decrease in peripheral resistance. So this would ultimately cause somewhat of a decrease in your blood pressure. Okay. So most of these are going to increase your blood pressure, except A and P. A and P would help decrease your blood pressure. Now, long-term maintenance. Okay. We mentioned long-term maintenance is going to work a little bit different. This involves your urinary system okay, and a few select hormones. Okay. Everything that we've been talking about up until this point, we have either messed with cardiac output and or peripheral resistance. Long-term maintenance of your blood pressure controls your blood volume. Okay, yeah, blood volume. Directly by how much urine you are producing or not. Okay, the more blood volume you have, the higher your blood pressure. The lower your blood volume, the lower your blood pressure. Okay, so when your blood pressure goes up, okay, your atrial cells secrete that AMP that we just mentioned. Okay, that causes your kidneys to excrete more water and more sodium. Okay. This decreases your blood volume, which decreases your blood pressure. Okay, this is an antagonist to aldosterone. Okay, so aldosterone, remember, okay, causes sodium retention and water retention. This would make your blood volume go up, 
which will make your blood pressure go up. Okay. When your blood pressure goes down, antidiuretic hormone is released. This increases your thirst, makes you thirsty. Okay. You're going to drink more water, and that water is going to be retained more than normal. This will cause your blood volume to go up, which causes your blood pressure to go up. Okay. Now, one more thing, if your blood pressure goes down, we can also secrete renin from your kidneys. This starts the RAS pathway that we've mentioned a few times. This will ultimately activate angiotensin 2. Okay. We just mentioned angiotensin 2 was a vasoconstrictor, which helps increase your blood pressure. Okay. Also induces your thirst mechanism, so you drink more water, and you'll retain more of that water. We're going to have sodium retention, which causes water retention as well. All of these will increase your blood volume, which increases your blood pressure. And last but not least, don't forget the angiotensin II triggers the release of aldosterone, which again causes sodium retention, which causes water retention, which increases your blood volume and increases your blood pressure. Okay, please, if you are not an expert on aldosterone yet, you got to get with it. Okay, aldosterone is basically on every exam. Okay, you've got to master aldosterone. All right, our recap slide. Okay. Um, short term mechanisms to regulate blood pressure. Uh, we've got um, hormones, epinephrine, norepinephrine, okay, working on peripheral resistance, sympathetic stimulation as well, um, decreased peripheral resistance, okay from your parasympathetic system or decreased sympathetic activity. So all of these, are going to either increase or decrease peripheral resistance. Okay. And then we have both endocrine and neural pathways that can either increase or decrease your heart rate, which would increase or decrease your cardiac output, and therefore increase or decrease your blood pressure. And all right, so these are all of our short term up top. Okay, our long term down below is either increasing or decreasing your blood volume, okay, which would directly increase or decrease your blood pressure. So again, these review slides, okay, make sure everything in these review slides makes perfect sense.